in seven classes, we finally managed to cover two chapters. And this class number eight, we're going to breeze through one chapter and start the next chapter. There's a total of five chapters. Starts with eight and nine, which we completed. Now it's the beginning of ten. Thus far, we find uh, Dhruva has gone back to the capital city after his being uh, visited by Narada and then his austerities and his practices of devotional service. Then Lord Vishnu comes. He offers his prayers to Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu grants him the um, fulfillment of both desires, the desire to have this amazing kingdom that's better than that of Lord Brahma. So what's, better, what's better than Lord Brahma? It's a spiritual world. Because beyond the abode of Lord Brahma, there's the coverings of the universe. And beyond the coverings of the universe, there's the spiritual sky. And within the spiritual sky, there's um, spiritual planets, the abode of Narayana and in Vaikuntha. But he gets a special planet. The special planet is a spiritual planet within the universe. The pole star, or Dhruva Loka. And he remains there till the end of the universe. And there's different understandings of what happens to Dhruva when the universe is over. That, that Certainly that planet remains because it's in abode of Lord Vishnu that's not destroyed. But his service in Dhruvaloka, because, because, yeah. Remember when he was doing his austerities, and by his austerities, restraining his breathing, the prana within his body was blocked, and the prana within the universe was blocked because he had become so powerful. So similarly, not identically, but he is, his position in Drivaloka, as he's the, the air, the ropes of the air that extend from Drivaloka to each of the planets below Drivaloka, that means Bhuvaloka, Bhuvarloka, Swargaloka, particularly Bhuvar and Swargaloka planets. When you look up into the sky, there's a vertical hierarchy. And just below Dhruvaloka is the Saptarishis, or the Big Dipper, you know, in a horizontal dimension of the universe. And below that, the Saptarishis, there's various heavenly planets. And below that, there's the Bhuvarloka region. Bhuvarloka region is inhabited by... Gandharvas and Siddhas and Charanas and so forth, higher beings, Vidyadharas, and then Buloka, Bumandala, where we are. So those ropes of air that extend from Dhruvaloka are no longer needed when the universe is over. So what's he going to preside over? The planet isn't destroyed because it's a spiritual planet. It's the abode of Vishnu. Vishnu isn't destroyed. The abode of Vishnu isn't destroyed. The spiritual planets are destroyed. In fact, not only at the end of the cosmic manifestation, at the end of each day of Brahma, there's a partial annihilation. Right? No? 
Yes? No? Partial annihilation? You're not responding one way or the other. Partial annihilation? Okay, that was, he's not, hey, thank you. I got a nod. Partial annihilation means during Brahma's night, the partial annihilation happens this way. There's a, an extended period of no rain, so everything becomes dry. And when everything becomes dry, then it's very easy to ignite fire. So from the bottom of the universe, from the mouths of Sheshanag, fire comes from his mouth. And the lower portion of the universe becomes engulfed in fire. And then there's an inundation of rain and the waters start to flood. And all, that's, all that, the, the planets that were first dry and then engulfed in flame, they become ashes and they dissolve in the flood that rises. Something similar in the, in the Bible to Noah's Ark. There's a big flood. And that flood goes up to and just below uh, the, the Svargaloka region. But the Sapta Rishis are not endangered. But because the flame, the fire is so hot during the fire part, the planets above Dravaloka starts with Maharloka. What's Maharloka? Maharloka is a planet, it's described very nicely in Brihat Bhagavatamrita. It's a planet that's above heaven, and it's for householders who like yagya. They like yagya so much because when the yagya is going on, they can see Lord Vishnu come and extend his hands to receive the offering that they offer during the yagya. When the yagya is over, he recedes back into the fire. So they hurry up and get another yagya going. There's a non-stop yagya plan in Maharloka. They're very elevated. They're, they, have no, they don't have desires like the residents of Swarga. They desire service to the Lord in that way. Maharloka, then above Maharloka is Janaloka. Less is said about Janaloka. So the residents of Maharloka and Janaloka go to Tapaloka during the night of Brahma because it's too hot below. They stay until the night of Brahma is over and then they return to their realm, Maharloka and Janaloka. And it's in the morning, Brahma recreates that portion of the universe that's the three upper, three of the upper planetary systems and seven of the lower ones because they're all withdrawn or dissolved, dissolved within the Garbhadak Ocean because the Garbhadak Ocean rises and then subsides to the bottom half of the universe. So, Dhruva has a service when he's presiding over Dhruvaloka. He has a service in relation to the other planetary systems, particularly Bhuvar and Svargalokas. He helps to maintain them. Although Vishnu is the maintainer, he has some service like that. So anyway, we heard some say that the end of the universe, at the total annihilation, Dhruva goes to Mah uh, Mahavaikuntha, the spiritual abode in the spiritual sky. So he didn't go there yet. He's still back on earth, ruling the earth planet. He has a big kingdom. And he, when he was old enough, mature enough to assume that responsibility, 
His father established him as the king. And the father went to the forest and followed the footsteps of Dhruva. And he, it was, he wanted to, in this is Satya Yoga again, so he goes to the forest to do Dhyan Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga in a manner very similar to what Dhruva did. And that's how the chapter ends. So now he's ruling the kingdom. And we're going to hear a little bit about what happens as he's ruling the kingdom. He has an encounter with the Yakshas. And the uh, Yaksha, who are the Yakshas? What, do you know something about the Yakshas? What are the Yakshas? They're associates of Kuvera. And? They're devotees of Lord Shiva. Yes, they are. Because Kuvera is very dear to Lord Shiva. And um, in fact, it said, the Mount Kailash, where Lord Shiva resides, is part of the gardens of Kuvera. Remember when Narada Muni went to visit Kuvera? And he saw the sons of Kuvera in their intoxicated, etc., etc., state. So Kuvera is, a, is very devoted to Lord Shiva, and the Yakshas who are devoted to Kuvera are de devoted to Lord Shiva. What else do we know about the Yakshas? They're, they have mystical powers. Fantastic. They're um, very powerful, warrior-like personalities. They are. They they have a whole range of appearance, but some of them are fierce-looking. Some are ghost-like looking. You know, followers of Lord Shiva, and specifically in the category of associates of Kuvera. They have a capital city. The capital city is Alakapuri. Alakapuri. So we're going to hear about Dhruva's visit to that place. The circumstance of his visiting was one that was not very nice. It was misfortune. In the first three verses, we hear about Dhruva's marriage. He had two wives. Uh, one of the, the wives' names was Brahmi, Brahmi, and they had two sons, Kalpa and Vatsara. Kalpa and Vatsara. He had a second queen. Her name was Illa, and there was one son and one daughter, Utkala, and the daughter's name isn't even given. We don't hear much about them in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, we do hear this. His younger brother Uttama was still unmarried. And as Uttama once went hunting and was killed by the powerful Yakshas in the Himalaya mountains. And the Himalaya mountains are in the north country. And the Alakapuri is also in the north country. So he was off in the forest, in the Himalayas, and one, it's a, a powerful yaksha, killed him. And when, as we heard from the previous chapter, when his mother, Suruchi, heard of his death, she went into the forest, which was ablaze in a forest fire, and she died. Or she followed, followed the path of her son. So news of the killing of his brother, stepbrother, Uttama, was brought to Dhruva. He's the king. He's now not just a five-year-old boy. He's a mature king, and he's very foul for a warrior, and he gets in a angry mood. He's already had an encounter with anger, 
he's having another encounter with anger. There was some question yesterday. You asked the question yesterday about how can he be angry if he was such a pure devotee? Was it your question? Your question. And it's it's um, one of those things. You know, the apichet sudara charo bhajate mam ananyabhak. This sudurachar can happen even in the case of someone who's an undivided devotee, ananya bhakta. It, it normally would not happen, but in extreme circumstances it may and sometimes does happen. He became very angry. So he left his capital city. When Dhruva Maharaj heard of the killing of his brother Uttama by the Yakshas in the Himalaya mountains, being overwhelmed with lamentation and anger, he got on his chariot and went out for victory over the city of the Yakshas, Alakapuri. Now it wasn't just, the, the detail is, and it's important, it wasn't just punishing a wrongdoer, he was taking it out on the whole group of Yakshas, the whole city of the Yakshas. And when he left, it wasn't just you know solo on his chariot. He took a vast army. Dhruva Maharaj went to the northern direction of the Himalaya range. In a valley, he saw a city full of ghostly persons, poor followers of Lord Shiva. Here's the painting that looks like the followers of Lord Shiva. There's Lord Shiva carrying his trident on some uh, palanquin carrier. It doesn't look like Nandi, but it's in any case. And uh, some very interesting looking creatures were his worshippers, the Yakshas. Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, as soon as Dhruva Maharaj reached Alakapuri, he immediately blew his conch shell. And the sound reverberated throughout the entire sky and in every direction. The wives of the Yakshas became very much frightened. From their eyes it was apparent that they were full of anxiety. And when the Yakshas heard the sound, they were ready to fight, because that was the Khanshal shell is indicating, were coming for battle. The great powerful heroes of the Yakshas, unable to tolerate the resounding vibration of the Khanshal shell of Dhruva Maharaj, came forth from their city with weapons and attacked Dhruva. There were a lot of them. Dhruva Maharaj, who was a great charioteer, and certainly a great bowman also, immediately began to kill them by simultaneously discharging arrows three at a time. Okay, so now comes something young boys always like, a battle scene. Right? Here we go. A fierce battle ensued. Even though attacked severely by Dhruva, the Akshas applauded Dhruva. Well done, well done. The Yaksha soldiers were 130,000 strong, all greatly angry and all desiring to defeat the wonderful activities of Dhruva Maharaj. They covered Dhruva Maharaj with showers of arrows. Dhruva looked like a mountain covered by incessant rainfall. Now that's poetic. And Prabhupada explained in the purport there's a indirect meaning or a hidden meaning. When a mountain is covered by incessant rain, all dirty things are washed from the body of the mountain. Similarly, the incessant shower of arrows from the enemy gave Dhruva Maharaj new vigor to defeat them. In other words, whatever incompetency he might have had washed away. So the battle is going to continue. There's the demigods up in the sky observing all of this. And there's warriors on the backs of elephants. And there's some foot soldiers. Looks like the guys and the elephants are going to win. 
Cries of dismay arose from the Siddhas watching from the sky. He has been killed. The grandson of Manu, like the sun, has sunk in the ocean of the Aksas. That's another metaphor. Although seeming to drown in the ocean, the sun is not harmed. Similarly, Dhruva had no difficulty. Or Vishwanath writes in his purport or commentary, like the sun in the ocean, he had disappeared in the ocean of the Yaksas. The hidden meaning is that even in this condition, Dhruva could not be harmed. Just as the sun is not harmed by setting in the ocean. Then, the Yakshas being temporarily victorious exclaimed that they had conquered Dhruva Maharaj. But in the meantime, Dhruva's chariot suddenly appeared, just as the sun suddenly appears from within a foggy mist. There he is, Dhruva on his chariot. Looks like he's just riding a horse here. Dhruva Maharaja's bow and arrows twanged and hissed, causing lamentation in the hearts of his enemies. He began to shoot incessant arrows, shattering all their different weapons, just as the blasting wind shatters the assembled clouds in the sky. Okay, so now there's a bunch of battle texts. Fierce battle continues, and the Yaksha flee. It covers eight verses. Dhruva Maharaj's arrows dismantled the bodies of Yakshas just like Indra's thunderbolt would dismantle mountains. That's Indra with his thunderbolt over on the left side. Yakshas flee from the battlefield just like herds of elephants who had become the plaything of a lion. So they retreat back into the capital city of Alakapuri. But it's not over yet. Speaking to his charioteer, cautious and worrying about a counterattack by the enemy, Druva then heard a sound which seemed to come from the ocean. Then he saw dust in all directions caused by the wind. And then mystical displays were presented by the Yaksas. Clouds rained torrents of blood, mucus, pus, stool, urine, and marrow. Human trunks began to fall from the sky. Maces, swords, iron, spiked clubs, and other clubs began to fall. Snakes breathing thunderbolts and vomiting fire, along with herds of mad elephants, lions, and tigers. Pretty scary. Oceans became fierce, as if it was the end of a kalpa. Kalpa means day of Brahma. Partial annihilation. So seeing all this, which is a mystical display, Dhruva was amazed and stunned. And he stopped fighting. Dhruva is bewildered by the Yaksha's illusions. Mystic mountains, it's up on the upper right side, animals, on the lower right side, oceans, thunder, lightning, various threatening visions. Good thing for Dhruva. He brought some sages with him. And the sages knew that Vishnu said that he would rule his father's kingdom for 36,000 years which means he couldn't be defeated. So they reminded him, Hey, Dhruva. I mean, that's not what they said. Here's what they said. O oh, Dhruva, may the Supreme Lord, carrier of the bow, reliever of distress to the surrendered souls, 
By hearing or chanting whose name people easily cross unsurpassed death, kill your enemies. The sages thought that if one can cross death by hearing about the Lord, then Dhruva could easily overcome the Yaksha's magic spell. Thus they made him remember the Narayana weapon. What's the Narayana weapon? It's a it's an astra. Astra is a weapon. And it, the astra is connected to the name Narayana. So it's a mystic weapon or a transcendental weapon that is used in conjunction with his bow and arrows, but it's a weapon that once he fixed this Narayana astra weapon on his bow, the whole mystic display just poof disappeared. As soon as Dhruva Maharaj joined the Narayana Astra arrow to his bow, the illusion created by the Yakshas was immediately vanquished. Just as all material pains and pleasures are vanquished when one becomes fully cognizant of the self. The significant here is he lost his composure but he was such an elevated personality that just some word, sound vibration from the sages checked immediately, checked that bewilderment. He knew what to do, and as soon as he knew what to do and placed this Narayana Astra weapon to his bow, empowered by the name of the Lord, poof, Maya was gone. It's a, a weapon of Lord Vishnu in sound vibration form. Prabhupada writes in his purport, Without Narayana, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, no one is able to overcome the action of the illusory energy. Because that's what it was. It was the illusory energy. They had capacity to display the illusory energy in mystical ways that the rest of us don't have. I mean, it, one can learn them. You become a yaksha and you learn them. And then you use them for these kinds of things. For bewildering people. But the calling of the holy name, or this Narayana Astra, by the help of Narayana, one can overcome the illusory energy. Then Prabhupada writes, similarly, in this age of Kali, what's the astra? Yeah. Sangopanga astra parshadam, yagyai sankirtana prayayar, yajanti hi samedasa. So the, the upangas, the associates of the Lord, engaging in the Hare Krishna Mahamantra Kirtan, that's the Narayana Astra for this age that drives away Maya, chanting of Hare Krishna. That's the weapon to drive away Maya. Now, notice we're already in the 11th chapter. That was pretty quick, wasn't it? Next verse, Krishna is like the sun, and maya, or the illusory energy of Krishna, is like darkness. Darkness means absence of light. Similarly, maya means absence of Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness and maya are always there side by side. As soon as there is an awakening of Krishna consciousness, all the illusory pains and pleasures of material existence are vanquished. Maya tatamidam. Constant chanting of the Maha Mantra will keep us always aloof from the illusory energy of Maya. So it's in the midst of a battle and he's fixed the Narayana Astra so the apparition magic of the Yakshas is gone. There's a little sound. Let's see if it works. It's not working. Hang on.
even as Dhruva Maharaj fixed the weapon made by Narayana Rishi onto his bow, arrows with golden shafts and feathers like the wings of a swan flew out from it. They entered the enemy soldiers with a great hissing sound, just as peacocks enter a forest with tumultuous crowing. There's a peacock entering a forest. Okay, that's enough of that. Powerful weapon. Attacked by the Yakshas, Dhruva cut off their arms, thighs, necks, and torsos with his arrows and brought them to Satyaloka where the brahmacharis go after surpassing the sun. What's that all about? Those who are celibates and wish to achieve the um, spiritual realm, Satyaloka can mean the abode of Lord Brahma. Satyaloka can also mean the spiritual sky or the spiritual realm. Getting killed by the Lord and his devotees only brings benefit. Here's further explanation by Vishwanath. Because of being killed by the hand of a devotee, they got special elevation. As the Gita says, they return again to earth, planet, up Brahma Bhuvana Loka Punar Avar Tanurjana. From all planets up to Brahma Loka, people return, O Arjuna. One should not think that they attain liberation with the sannyasis at the end of Brahma's life. That is because one does not see, even see liberation given to those killed by the Lord, such as Kalanemi, other than when killed by Krishna. So what's he saying? In the second canto, chapter 7, there's a list of incarnations, just like there is in first canto, chapter 3, a list of incarnations. And in chapter 7, of Canto 2, it says, it kind of expands what it says about Krishna, and it gives a long list of those who are killed by Krishna, and they all achieve liberation, either Sayuja or Salokya. Depends on the circumstance. But those that are not killed by Krishna, even forms of Vishnu, such as Vishnu killing Kalanemi, Kalanemi didn't achieve liberation. Who did Kalanemi become in his next life? Kamsa. Previous life was Kalanemi. When killed by Krishna, he achieved liberation. When killed by Vishnu, he became Kamsa. He didn't get liberation. So this uh, Brahma Loka situation, here's a little detail. Uh, during the big fight, when Kalanemi, who is pictured on the left in this drawing, was killed by Vishnu, who was mounted on the back of Garuda, uh, he got dismembered by the arrows and the Chudas on Chakra of Vishnu. But he didn't go to heaven. Now here's uh, a nice depiction of the churning of the milk ocean. There's Kurma at the bottom, there's Vishnu at the top, and the Mandra mountain. The demons wanted to be by the head of Vasaki and they getting the, the flames from his, the, the serpent's mouth. The demigods are at the tail of Vasuki and they're churning the milk ocean. And we see so many things coming out of the churning of the milk ocean. When the demon Kalanemi, who was carried by a lion, saw the Supreme Personality of Godhead carried by Garuda was on the battlefield, the demon immediately took his trident, whirled it, 
and discharge it at Garuda's head. The Supreme Personality of God at Hari, the master of the three worlds, immediately caught the trident, and with the very same weapon he killed the enemy of Kalanemi, Kalanemi along with his carrier, the lion, and of Kalanemi, but not liberation. Now here we see Hiranyakashipu, another Kalanemi. There's a different Kalanemi. One, the different Kalanemi than the one in this pastime was a grandson of Hiranyakashipu, or one of Prahlad's brother's sons, Kalanemi, different one. And there's another Kalanemi whose made, reference is made in um, Ramayana. He's the son of Maricha, who's Maricha. Maricha is a relative of Ravana, kind of like an uncle by relationship. And Maricha was the son of the demon Sunda, who was uh, the demon Sunda and Tataka. That's Maricha. We know who's Tataka. She was the one that got killed by Ram and Ram's arrows. Kalanemi was Maricha's son and he was the minister of Ravana. And during the, the, the battle in Lanka, he was especially assigned to kill Hanuman. But it kind of didn't work out. <laughs> didn't kill Hanuman. So all of this is like a little detour just to appreciate the statement that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is making, when they were killed and they went to Satyaloka, it's that we should not understand that they got liberation. Because liberation comes when being killed by Krishna. When Swayamvavamanu saw that his grandson Dhruva Maharaj was killing so many of the yakshas, who are not offenders, out of his great compassion he approached Dhruva with great sages to give him good instruction. Now this is, we're just ending this whole section. So get ready. It's coming to a, a, an abrupt close, this section. Dhruva was protected. He was protected by his bhakti. And part of the protection that was afforded to him by his bhakti was his great-grandfather. Now the protection came in the form of his great-grandfather. No, excuse me. His grandfather. Swami Bhuvamana was his grandfather. Utpadan Pada was his father. Swami Bhuvamana was his grandfather. Brahma was his great-grandfather. So Swami Bhuvamana saw what was going on. And it wasn't right. He was, he had, he had lost it. He was overwhelmed with anger that his brother, stepbrother, had been killed. So he was taking, it's the duty of the king for a wrongdoer that the wrongdoer is to be, the justice is to be brought, and the wrongdoer for killing is to be, there's a death penalty. But it doesn't mean that the whole one the th- th- hundred and thirty thousand soldiers are to be killed, and I want to speak of all the other people that that soldiers are protecting. He was going to wipe out the whole place. So that's not a- appropriate. So it, it it's um, Swami Bhuvamanu came, and just like this, one of the characteristics of a devotee and the protection for a devotee, when the devotee hears. Wisdom is supposing they get off track. In this case, he got off track. Just by hearing good instruction, he's back on track immediately. That's a sign of an elevated person. Sound vibration is sufficient. Good instruction is sufficient. 
So we should be so fortunate to have such bhakti that someone comes along and taps us on the shoulder and says, my dear Prabhu, um, it seems that you're not acting in an appropriate manner here. And here's why. Here's This is why it's inappropriate. Here's what's appropriate. So here's what you should do. And in the end of the next section, he's going to say, not only you're, you're offending the yaksas by killing so many, but they're followers of Kuvera. You need to find Kuvera and, and offer your apologies to Kuvera. And what happens is, he immediately stops, and Kuvera comes to him and says, you pleased me very much by being so responsive to your grandfather. And I'd like to give you some benediction. It's like there's no retribution, at least in this particular case, no retribution from Kuvera. We're getting a picture of, you know, how elevated souls conduct themselves, even in conjunction with other elevated souls. Now, our the, the impetus for our activity isn't generally so elevated, but it, it, how do we get elevated? <laughs> by, by hearing transcendental messages and appreciating the characteristics and qualities. That's, you know, sound vibration is essential. Harikata, the whole, it's, it's, about, it's about Lord Vishnu and his great devotee Dhruva. And Swami Bhavamana was also a great devotee, and Lord Brahma is a great devotee. We're hearing, and Dranar is a great devotee. We're hearing about so many, there's three Mahajans in this whole story. Narada, Swami Bhavamana, and Lord Brahma. Three of the twelve Mahajans are all woven into this one story. And Dhruva becomes exalted by their kindness. Of course, he's making some very uh, strong efforts, but their kindness is essential. And he's protected. His bhakti is protecting him means they're protecting him. Something from his side, then in turn, the reciprocation from their side. And that's the next verse from the Kipram Bhavati Dharmat Ma. The Apichet Sudharacharo verse, how Krishna it, it corrects that person is in the very next verse. Now he does from within, but he can also do from without. The prompt from within of Swami Bhavamano to go to Dhruva, tap him on the shoulder, give some good advice, and you know the wrongdoing is corrected immediately. It's, it's, it's very nice lessons. So, you know, a, a reflection question for us. When there's some sudden confrontation, how do you respond? Because there's language in all of this. React and respond. So, respond as if you're thoughtful, then you can, you can consider what's going on here, what's the best thing to do in this situation. It can be just fight or flight. And what, in your case, in my case, what brings us to restoring our focus and attention and a, a mood, a proper mood of serving instead of the fight or flight response. So that's the Bhagavatam teaching us about An important lesson. Now, this is a much shorter class than some of the other ones. They've been really long. But this is the end. So let's see if there's some discussion. You have something. Thank you, Maharaj. I'm trying to understand Dhruva's mood. Um, Dhruva knew with this conversation with the Lord 
that this would happen his brother would be killed by yakshas and he had a memory lapse apparently <laughs> he was covered uh, that's how how do you forget i mean he didn't he knew, want, but he forgot but when he went back he didn't want his um stepmother or his uh, step brother he he didn't want retribution that's correct but it came anyways now the retrib- we, we we went over this four times here's the fifth time it's not that utama did something wrong in the in connection with drove us being insulted and and all those things why that misfortune came to him of being killed when he was in the forest hunting we we don't have that understanding what was the cause it wasn't in defense to drova but it was some cause and there was the and the event happened as vishnu said it would happen so now what's your question be clear what your question is the question is understanding dhruva why he would not warn his step brother that this would happen or oh we don't know what the conversation took place between them huh. we don't know you have to write some more pages to the bhagavatam or ask me yeah, hey could you write could you expand that section you know, because what do we know about things like this what do we know about transcendental things or or historical things we know from from the, the vedas and we know from the commentaries upon the vedas w- w- of those who have the capacity to know things that we don't have the capacity to know and to my knowledge there's nothing in the in the bhagavatam or our commentaries Now, there may be something in some other purana that i'm also not aware of whether something was explained what what was the exchange between them drova and utama whatever it was we don't know and when it happened drova lost it you know punishing a wrong doer is appropriate for the king going on a rampage isn't appropriate for a king for a religious king what's up go ahead mm-hmm. uh, so my mask mask <laughs> Nikrishna Maharaj so my question was about some the yakshas can you use the microphone thank you the yakshas so the yakshas what that microphone mouth and microphone Ooh. there we go it's there you just use your mouth and the microphone together yes why actually why didn't Kuvera why did Kuvera bless Dhruva it didn't happen yet He was pleased with him that he he stopped immediately upon hearing the words of Manu. He was appreciating his quality and the character the just the words of Manu and this big battle thing just came instantly came to a stop. He was appreciating his character. Supposing, you know, your mother or father you're doing some silly thing and they say can you please stop that silly thing oh and you just stop that silly thing they say oh thank you very much like that that you know you may not stop the silly thing and that's another story you got you got the idea yes maharaj okay in the back Go ahead. Let's go in the back. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. So, towards the start of the lecture, you were talking about how um, Kuvera or Lord Shiva is very fond of Kuvera, and how um, 
Alokopuri is or Kailash is in supposedly the gardens of Kuvera. So I was a little confused as to where Kuver Lok was. Is it in the material world or where? Okay. It, it, it's, it, I'll do the best I can because it's a little puzzling. My understanding is elevated persons like Kuvera, they have multiple residences. Elevated persons like Yamaraj, they have multiple residences. Elevated persons like Varuna, they have multiple residences. And and where those multiple residences are <coughs> in the whole of Vedic cosmology is a little puzzling. You know, the principle, and so, you know, and in a couple of cases, I spent a lot of time trying to trace down where the multiple abodes of Yamaraj and the multiple abodes of... Because like when, when Krishna, for example, when Krishna is looking for his father who is taken from the Jamuna River to the abode of Varuna, where's that? You know, you, you, you dive in the, in the river Jamuna, you're going to find where Varuna lives? Where's that? So it's, it's, it's not easy to understand. This is the, the preamble here. There's a uh, higher dimensional space that immediately, because you like science, so you know something about higher dimensional space. It's, a, it's a, at least a science theory. There's, spa there's three dimensional space and there's higher dimensional space. So some living entities have access to higher dimensional space. That's how yogis, for example, can travel so swiftly from one place to another place as if they're adjacent because they travel through higher dimensional space, not three-dimensional space. They know how to do that. So that makes it like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Now, where's the abode of Kavira? <laughs> and where's Alakapuri? And, you know, it, it sounds like it sounds like the Himalayas are what we know as the three-dimensional Himalayas. But they're, my, uh, my understanding, intuitive understanding, not scriptural founded understanding, is that there's another idea of the Himalayas than just what you, you know, you get in a, an airplane and go zoom, zoom, and you're flying over the Himalayas. Or you go by foot and you're just in the Himalayas. There's another higher dimensional Himalayas. For example... For example, in the description of Bumandala, there's seven islands. Have you ever seen islands that are shaped like a ring with an ocean between another island? We haven't seen anything like that. And then in the, the central island, what's the name of that central island? It's Antar Dweep. Dweepa means island. Antar means central. And there's seven varshas, or tracts of land, and they're divided by mountain ranges. And on the others, there's one mountain range, and then there's a valley on the other side of the valley, and then there's a mountain range. And we don't see that configuration. But the Himalayas is one of those mountain ranges. Is it the same Himalayas? Or is it a, a higher dimensional Himalayas? Or what is it? You know, to, to break down, because you, you were saying you're going to write a, a paper on cosmology. Good luck. Because the language of the, the, of the fifth canto Bhagavatam, and it's consistent in other parts of the Vedas, mm. was the configure, was the structure, to, to speak of the upper places, just even Bhumandala. What, what is it? So, your question is, where's the abode of Kuvera? And I'm saying it's not easy to explain it. He has multiple abodes, that much we know. And uh, in his abode, one of those abodes, he has a garden. And in that garden is where his sons were. Garden was like kind of like a forested area with a, a stream and so forth and so on. And that's where Narada went to pay a visit to Kuvera. But also, part of, part of Kuvera's abode is a place, one of the Mount Kailashas is that garden of Kuvera. Because he, he, because Kuvera is such devo so devoted, he offered him, please reside here for some time. It's nice. 
So he did. But there's other places where Lord Shiva resides besides that place. And there's like, that's also complicated. So I'm not giving a very, you know, from point A to point B, here's a straight line. That's not the answer I'm giving you. The answer I'm giving you is there's multiple abodes of Kuvera in, in different places within cosmology. And depending upon the function, just like wealthy people have multiple homes, so Kuvera, he's the treasure. And he has multiple homes. And the, so the Alakapuri isn't his home. It's the home of the Yakshas. It's the capital of the Yakshas. The worshippers of Lord Shiva and their followers of Kuvera. And, you know, it, it speaks. Dhruva's getting on a chariot and going somewhere. He's going to Alakapuri in the Himalaya range. And then there's this valley, and that's where Alakapuri is. But, you know, I don't know if we go, in, go into the Himalayas and go up in the Himalayas and see a valley somewhere, and there's Alakapuri. I don't know if we're going to see that in, in three-dimensional space. Now, here's, a, here's another one. Even the Yakshas. I mentioned what's in the Bhuvar Loka region. Yakshas are mentioned as residing in the Bhuvar Loka region. But they, they can also descend. Like Rakshasas are also in the Bhuvar Loka region, but they can descend. Just like the Rakshasas were inhabiting Lanka. Ravana was inhabiting Lanka, and he's a Rakshasa. But he was a worshiper of Lord. Anyway, so it's, it's, it's not two dimensional, it's not three dimensional even. That's, so it, it, for, for, for a, a Western mind, Western trained, educated mind, it's not very satisfying. It's too like, what's all this about? It's a mystery, for sure. But it's not fiction. It's, it's mysterious. Behind you. Okay. 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 Go ahead. You go ahead. You got the microphone. Hi, Krishna. Uh, I have a question, but I also want to kind of get an idea of your answer to Aditi. Um, is it similar to like... I'm not sure, but in the moon, there are higher beings who live in the moon. But if we go to the moon, it just looks like... It's, 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 that's, it, that's, that's true, but it's very different. You know, we have an idea where the moon is. It's not like there's multiple moons. This is, there's multiple Kavero residences. Okay. Yeah. I mean, here, here, here's... Cause it's nice to ponder over these things. It's nice to contemplate things that you can't understand. I mean, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but it's nice to contemplate them. There's, there's a, for example, here's one of them. It comes in Ramayana. When uh, Sugriva is sending the Vanaras in the four directions, he describes the places that we, we have never seen in the, in different, in the four directions. And Ram asks him, how, did you, how do you know about all these places? As if you've been there. He said, I was there when I was fleeing from my brother, Mali. I went to all these places. I saw all these places, so I know about them. But where are those places? It's places we've never seen. You can't put it in your GPS and go there. But they exist. So where are they? And there's many such examples. Many such examples. Um, Go ahead, next. Uh, so when we come to a situation that gives, like where we have to fight or like, or flight, like the whole situation, mm -hmm. it says that, um, in the slide it said that uh, you should find the appropriate uh, path to go back to the uh, service attitude. Yes. Is it possible? Yes. Uh, I think it's possible. Like, 
if you can take you can actually fight in that situation to go back to the surface attitude like is that possible or is yeah it... if that's what Krishna wants it's certainly possible it's in it's in the list the menu list but it depends on what Krishna wants and it also depends on your character and qualification okay thank you Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question can about... You do, can you say your question with your mask down? Then I can hear you better. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I, I had a question about why did the Yakshas kill Dhruv Maharaj's brother? We don't know. It's not the Yakshas, it was one. And the motive for that killing of his brother, we don't know. We don't know. Anyone else? Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. <clears throat> so if we're in the, um, say we're walking down the street and someone attacks us, what do you do? then what do we do? I mean, to get into the mode of service, say, how would we, how would we deal it, with it, that? It, if you know martial arts, you know what to do. Yeah, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would fight. Yeah, yeah. It would depend. Yeah, if, if if you're if you're skilled at fighting, that's what you do. But you know, when you're skilled at fighting, the 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 the, the, the higher skill is not just to know how to fight, but how to keep your mind fixed on Krishna while you're fighting. I mean, Arjun knew how to do that. He knew how to do that because he was attached to Krishna. Where whatever he did, it was with his mind on Krishna. So for us, it's not. You're back to your question. What do you do if you're walking down the street and you're attacked? You call Krishna's name very loudly, very loudly, very loudly, and if Krishna so desires, he may protect you from the harm. I'll, I'll tell you two two little stories from within my experience. One time. In New York City, we were um, the all group, a whole group of us were going on Hari Nam, and uh, you know, distributing books at a concert that was at Grand Central in in Central Park. There was one girl who was kind of lagging behind the rest of the group, and as she was passing along through Central Park, some guy jumped out of a bush and started to attack her and drag her to the bush to do his dirty thing. So what did she do? She screamed Krishna's name at the top of his lungs, the top of her lungs, and the guy just left her. She was trembling, but Krishna's holy name, chanted very loudly, protected her. Thank you. Also, I had another question. I have um, another story. Oh, oh, that's true, sorry. Here's the other story. <laughs> Similarly, a whole group of us were coming back because this is something that we did a lot. There was another event, and what we, when, we, when we had Back to Godhead magazines in one hand and a mantra card in the other hand, we also had these little pouches with an elastic thing at the top, and donations would go in that little pouch with the elastic thing at the top. They would hang around our neck with a, you know, a strap. So to get to the temple, we had to go from the A train and then switch from the A train to the F train. So all the devotees got off and went to the, uh, the other side of the track to catch the F train. But one devotee, who was kind of eccentric person, he got on the wrong side and went to the uptown track instead of the downtown track. So as he was standing there, we said, hey, you know, come on over here, you're supposed to be over here, this kind of eccentric person. And as we were speaking like that, here comes the, the downtown train, and we couldn't see him. And we, but we heard a scream. He was, he was screaming Nishringadev's name because a mugger came along and wanted that little bag that was hanging around his neck. 
and he screamed the Shringadev's name at the top of his lungs. The train pulled away, the guy was gone, and there was a devotee with the, the you know, protected by Lord Shringadev by his screaming Lord Shringadev's name. Now, it's not always going to happen like that. You know, don't stand in the wrong place with the money bag around your neck in New York City. But, you know, that's something that can you can do if you you don't have martial arts and you don't have any other kind of protection. So now, next question. Well, the other question was, uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, you were talking about... <clears throat> And I, and I don't remember all the words now, but th there was a fire on the planet, and yes. the people people went up to yes. a higher other planet yes, right, right. to get that's away right. from the fire. So yes, I don't remember. Right. Did they just, like, we were talking earlier about how they can go to other planets. Yeah, they had they do it that way? They had craft, like airplanes, not a 747, but a, you know, a mystical craft that could carry them to an upper planet. So they have the capacity to visit upper planets. They reside here, and they can pay a visit. And the method to get from their place to where they visit is mystical craft that travel, you know, without petrol, without rocket fuel. They just, they have the means because they have subtle sciences, subtle knowledge, and they can travel subtly. So for safety, they were welcomed in the upper re regions until the fire was subsided and then they returned. Thank you. Be nice to do that here, wouldn't it? Yeah. It was a forest fire. We just go away. <laughs> but it, you know, even better than, than, than above the forest fire is to be in higher consciousness. So the, the blazing fire of material existence is, is absolutely extinguished by, you know, being in a realm where nothing is temporary. Because everything that's temporary is going to be destroyed one way or another, sooner or later, like our bodies. Wouldn't it be nice to not have a body that's destroyed? Yes. And there's a method. And it may sound to some people, oh, that's silly. And they can say, okay, that's silly. But then they'll have a body that will be destroyed. So is, is there a possibility to have a body that's not destroyed yet? Yeah, absolutely, yes. That's the better science. Spiritual technology. Something else? Right next to you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. In reference to the uh, illusion, temporary illusion that you mentioned, uh, Yaksha has created to Dhruva, can you clarify, is there a modern day equivalent to that? And how modern day equivalent to what? The illusion that uh, Yaksha has created to Dhruva. The, the illusions that the Daksha, Yakshas created for Dhruva? Is there a modern comparison? Is that what you're asking? Yes, and is how different is it from the general illusion that we refer to with regards to us? Oh, it's, 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 it's similar but different. Modern illusion looks real. This also looked real. But, you know, the, the illusion of pus and blood and dismembered bodies and bludgeons and things falling from the sky, that's not usual. But it looks like, it looked like it. So that's the similarity. And the dissimilarity is, it was just fierce combat. Serpents with fire coming from their mouths and it's an apparition. Thank you. For, for, for purposes of frightening the, uh, an opponent, they knew how to do that. Right next to you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So at one point when the uh, when Dhruva Maharaj was fighting against the Yakshas, the a poetic expression comes as a comparison that the arrows over him were like mountains. At that point, it appears to me that his response to fight was being encouraged. Yeah. But later because on, because he's a Chatriya. When a Chatriya f faces combat, he's encouraged. He's not. He doesn't become fearful. He becomes more vigorous. But my conflict arises that that was that later it appears that's not the right action because he was killing people. Like yeah, it wasn't the right action. That's for sure. But you know, his chatra spirit was invigorated by opposition. 
It's like, you know, it's, it's you know, in our, our modern situation, it's like athletes. They like, they like combat. They like the competition. You know, when, when there's big sports events going on. And it's like, you know, they, they get really charged. Because they want to be victorious and don't want to lose. Anyway, so it, it's, it's, chivalry is, has its own mannerisms. The application of it is another thing. How are we doing? Any other questions over here? Okay, we'll do this and then come over here. It was a short class, but a lot of questions. Interesting. So, Maharaj, you mentioned that partial destruction occurs at the end of a kalpa. Uh, I'm not too sure. I, I, I don't know that much about uh, the partial destruction. So, I'll touch do, up do it again? Yeah, do it again. And also, what is, if that's partial destruction, what is like full destruction? What's the purpose? Uh, yeah, oh, that's, that would. That's, that's not your question. What's your question? What is like part like? What is it? Partial destruction, and what is the? F if there's a partial destruction, what's the full destruction? Okay. Full destruction, dissolution of the universe. Yeah. Okay. The periods of time are are not in the front of my mind, but what happens? Because time, every, every, you all know, time moves in cycles. The, the, the force of time moves in cycles. And there's small ones, there's medium ones, there's big ones. Force of time moves in cycles. So towards the end of Brahma's day, when it becomes Brahma's night, there's some signs that the day is ending and the night is beginning, just like the sun setting is a sign that day is over, the night is beginning. So the sign in the universe is there's no rain. There's drought for some number of years, if you get the number of years. Everything becomes like ready to ignite like anything. That goes on for some time. And then next, is from the mouths of Anantashesh at the bottom of the universe comes fire. And everything is so dry, it just bursts into flames. And the flames go up, up to and including the heavenly planets, but below Dravaloka. Not the Saptarishis, but below the Saptarishis, the heavenly planets down are all engulfed in flame. And then, Next, the Garbadak Ocean rises. So all that now carbon or you know burned material just dissolves within the ocean. Matter gets dissolved in the ocean, which stays for some time, the night of Brahma. And then the ocean recedes. It's Brahma's morning. And he does his morning sadhana. One part of which is meditating on the universal form, so he knows. Okay, it's like a you know a contractor looking at the blueprint. He knows how to build the whatever he's going to build, and he starts building it because he's got the materials and he has got the skill. So Brahma does that. He he recreates the universe from the lower seven up to the heavenly realm. He builds it again. That's in the morning of Brahma. That's a partial devastation. And then the upper, I mentioned, the upper four planets, they're not dis dissolved. They're not burned. They're not, they stay. They get really hot, Maharloka. So they go to upper, Tapaloka, and they stay there for some time, then return because their planets are just waiting for them to return, their homes, etc. And then that's the partial annihilation, and there's, you know, 
so many of those. For every day of Brahma, there's one of those. For every night of Brahma, there's one of those. And that the total cosmic annihilation or dissolution is the whole, the whole um, machinery is closed down. And um, so the, the, the method of that machinery closing down at the end of Brahma's day, what happens from Vishnu's side is he withdraws the time energy because it's time is one that's moving things in cycles. He just, with, it's really simple. He just pulls the plug. Because without the time energy, nothing happens. So he just withdraws the time energy, and the whole thing collapses. You know, the, the gross goes into the subtle, the subtle goes into the more subtle, the more subtle goes into the more subtle. It goes back into the pradhan state. The undifferentiated totality of material energy state and living entities are withdrawn within the body of Mahavishnu or excuse me, within the body of Garbhadakshay Vishnu and then the Garbhadakshay Vishnus are withdrawn because they're expanded they're withdrawn within the body of Mahavishnu and that the totality of living entities are now again at the end of his breathing period, the living entities are within the body of Mahavishnu for the duration of a universe. And then it's time for the universe. And then he exhales. And the whole thing happens again. In cycles. Thank you, Maharaj. Pretty mystical. We do online. Over here. Hare Krishna Maharaj, this question is from Satyavrata Prabhu. You mentioned that Bhakti protected Dhruva Maharaj. Why it was not before acting, since we know a devotee is thoughtful? Thank you. Well, it's the same question asked in a different way. How did Dhruva lose it? The tsunami hit him. You know, the the force of being overwhelmed with anger hit him, so he forgot. He forgot his position as a devotee of the Lord. How, if you're so elevated, how can that happen? It happened. The illusory energy acted temporarily as if he was one of us, but he's not. But So he was protected by an agent of the Lord, specifically, Manu. Next. Next question is by Arvind Devara Konda. In cases where a devotee is troubled by another person, mm. I have regretted the fight mentality because the offending person cannot be reasoned with and cannot realize their fault. Later, there is a regret in me that I might have offended that person because he now hates me and also sees me as a devotee of Krishna. This was to develop a grudging feeling towards Krishna too. This oh, way, like what kind of feeling toward Krishna? Grudging feeling. Grudging. He feeling or the other person is feeling? I think the other person. This way they develop a grudging feeling towards Krishna too. Yeah. yeah. This way I am not setting a good example as yeah. devotee of Krishna. Right. But I also want to fight for what's right. The question is, please help me with the proper steps I should remember before a fight mentality if this scenario repeats in future. Pause. Reflect, mode of goodness, all three are mode of goodness. Pause, reflect, mode of goodness, what's appropriate. In some cases, what's appropriate is you're real strong. In some cases, that's not appropriate. But you, you have the freedom to choose if you're in the mode of goodness, and you don't have the freedom to choose if you're moved by the impelling force of retribution. Injustice has been done, 
and I'm the peacemaker, or I'm the, I'm the law enforcement agency, and I'm going to bring justice. So if you think that that's who you are, um, you better be sure that that's who you are, because if you're not uh, the, the right person to be in that position of the law enforcer or the, the, the judge, you're, you're, you're going to not represent Krishna properly. So start with representing Krishna in your thoughts before you act. Hit the pause button. Go into reflective mode. If you practice at it, you can do it very quickly. Sometimes it's not clear. Better than, than better, don't act until there's some clarity. Then if you have to speak... It's, you know, we, we went over this several times. But, you know, even when, when um, wrongdoers, Krishna spoke with them, or R Ramachandra spoke with them in such a way, you know, ple pleading with them or uh, uh, giving them the opportunity to a course of right conduct before acting. So you know, that's what a, what a qualified person does. So if you don't have that qualification, don't take that position. You turn to Krishna. Or some, some representative of Krishna that has that authority and capacity. Now life moves quickly and we normally don't even think about these things. We just act. But you're asking in a, in, a, in a conscientious manner. So I'm trying to give you a conscientious person's response. If you live your life feeling there's, t there, there's an, I see injustice out there and I have to do something, you're going to be a really busy person your whole life. Understand, rather understand what it means to be be fixed in the consciousness of what it means to be a representative of Krishna and act accordingly. If you're, if you're a king, if you're a chatriya, then even chatriyas will ask before they act. They don't just act impulsively. They ask. It's like Maharaj Prikshit. When he saw the personality of Kali breaking the legs of the bull, he asked the bull, who did this? He saw what was happening. <laughs> but you ask. Don't just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the hand of justice, I'm going to act, because I, I, know, I know what just, justice is. That's foolish. You're concerned about being perceived as a representative of Krishna, which you are, and so act accordingly. If it's not your, if it, you know, you have to consider what's appropriate for your position and the situation. And sometimes you have to do it quickly. Sometimes you, you, you pause until it becomes clear. Next. Pretty much, I have one clarification question. Okay. So the Satya Loka mentioned in one of the slide is this the same as the Veda Swarga, which we discussed earlier, or is it different? It's not specified. All that's specified is what it's not. But what it is, because there could be more than one option of what it is. What Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is specifying, it's not the spiritual Brahmaloka. Those killed by Dhruva did not attain the spiritual Brahmaloka by making the reference to Kalanami and, you know, what has to be killed by Krishna to go to that place. That's not, that, that's not the place where they went. But you're, So the, the question is, which is the place? And we just know what it isn't. There could be other options. Brahmaloka can mean a, a number of different things. It could mean they attained the planet of Brahma. That's one possibility.
can I ask a follow up yeah, to sure. this? So then the second canto, chapter 7 verse, where it says that the Lord Vishnu or, or, or anyone killed by the Lord or by his devotees attain liberation. No, it says anyone killed by Krishna or devotees of Krishna on behalf of Krishna, they achieve liberation. That's what it says. Okay, so that Not means... Not Vishnu. It doesn't say Vishnu. Okay, so, that, so that means... Uh, Those Dhruva? killed by Vishnu don't get liberation. That's what it means. So that means with Dhruva also they didn't That's get liberation. That's exactly what it means. Okay. Thank you. Is there another online one? No. Okay. Okay. You want to take the microphone? Your father has a question. Maharaj, this is an unrelated question, but it came up in our Srimad Bhagavatam discussion. So we learn about 8,400,000 species of life forms. Is that all in all the universes? Or is it in just this universe, the varieties? I've not, you know, I cannot think of any specific reference from our Acharyas that says A or B. The presumption, it's 8,400,000 within each universe. But that's presumed. I don't know if it's explicitly said, you know, there's, you know, some lesser number in this universe and then some others that are over in that universe and others in another universe. I, it's just in a presumption or an assumption. In each universe, 8,400,000. Okay. So a person, let's say, dies in one universe, can go to another universe, or he stays within... That's a good... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that was the question which came... That's which... another question. You know, it, it's a silly question, excuse me for saying. But, you know, how does that kind of help one advance in Krishna consciousness? Questions that are asked should be relevant to what's going to help me make advancement in Krishna consciousness. So just gathering information, and gathering information, and you have a lot of information in your information basket. How is that going to help you advance in Krishna consciousness? And I'm not speaking against curiosity and you know wanting to understand things, but try to keep the 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 the, the boundary of what we'd like to understand, which, that which is going to help me advance in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, I'm sorry to go off in that direction, but Prabhupada would sometimes do that. And they'd kind of like stay on it until the, the person felt like they wanted to crawl under the rug or something. But the question should be relevant to um, spiritual progress. You have something? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm just uh, trying to understand what is a better way to what is a uh, better way to understand Dhruva Stuti or uh, like the prayers of Dhruva Maharaj. A better way to understand or absorb, uh, like for, yeah. for for instance, if we have uh, the prayers of Prahlad in the seventh canto. Uh, th there are few components like he, uh, as you mentioned, he starts with humility, and then uh, are they are these prayers based on their uh, situation and uh, and how do we better understand? How do we apply? Uh, understand. How do we imbibe? Or yeah, how do yeah. we imply? Yeah, yeah. Which the pr prayers of like. Is the verb understand or imbibe or apply? Uh, I understand. Understand. F firstly. There's layers of understanding with anything, such as prayers included. A starting point is uh, exactly as far as you can with the assistance of acharyas. What exactly is he saying? 
So the, 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 our acharyas will help you understand more closely exactly what he's saying. And then how does this fit together with that, fit together with that? So it, it, then it becomes a matter of becoming familiar with the flow. Because obviously he's a very important person in the Bhagavatam. His story is a celebrated story. It's therefore, and it's only 12 verses, so those prayers are important. So I want to understand these important prayers because he's an important person. So you, what's the message? And what are the, the sections or the elements? You know, like part of it is Vishnu is the source of the entire creation. So how do we understand that? He describes the expansions, Mahavishnu, Garbha Daksha Vishnu, Shira Daksha Vishnu. He's expanding on Vishnu Tattva. So that when we say Vishnu or any of the Vishnu forms, we have some clarity. This is how do we understand. He's seeing Vishnu in front of him. He's also seen that same Vishnu in his heart. So he has some understanding of Vishnu Tattva. And by understanding of Vishnu Tattva better, by hearing his prayers and how he's explaining it, it can help us. This is the application part. So, th to understand, you go over and you, know, you go over and you go over. Let's, let's, you know, here, here's two examples. Brahma Samhita and the Govindam prayers. Prabhupada re recites in a recording, you know, in 1970, Daily, one should enter into the spirit of this hymn as a regular daily function. So, I don't know if you've ex experienced reciting on a regular daily function, but if you experience reciting some prayers regularly, that it starts to go in. And the meaning becomes assimilated within, and then you can understand it better. Because it's not just... The, the jnana, it becomes more realized what the message is. And you know, so some important prayers are to be regularly recited. That's how we understand them better. Conceptual, and then internal, and then it starts to guide your life. Then you get a much better understanding what the prayers are. Okay. Thank you so much, Mark. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.